morning, church. We are stuck in assumption traps. Our national dialogue has become more about disconnected monologues. We have assumptions about ourselves and about others, which categorize, criticize, minimize, and judge. Unfortunately, we've come to believe that our assumptions about each other are objectively true. And so the common ground is shrinking. See a lot of studies about that. We used to have a lot more common ground than we do these days. I don't know if the common ground has really shrunk. It's just that we've, we're focusing on, on our differences like that. But when we, when we do that, Jonah's experience with the Ninevites helps us see what happens when our assumptions take over. I often uh, have know in me, in myself, that I'm one who will quickly make assumptions. I think we do that. You know, we meet somebody, we see some, even before they speak, we make quick assessments. You know, is this somebody I want to talk to? Somebody I want to listen to? Is this someone that has something to give me or something that I can, where I can be connected to them or not? Um, this is an area of my life I've been consciously working on. My assistant, assessment system, system was to, you know, work with, you know, work from these gut assumptions, feeling like they were right. Sometimes they are, but often they are not. I viewed people from my vantage point, not theirs. I then acted on my assumptions. I move either towards people or away from people almost, you know, immediately. Um, when I do choose to be open to someone I might not have otherwise, I'm often happily surprised. So, um, Carol read this sermon a few days ago, uh, and, this, and she wanted to know what my assumptions were of her when we first met. That's what happens when you let your wife read the sermon. Well, of course my assumptions were great about her. Of course they were. They were. <laughs> so other people aren't who we think they are. Who we think they are. You know, we're only seeing a, a portion of them. They are who they are. They're capable. They're resourceful. They have potential just like we do. No matter how they look, where they've been, what their lives have been like, Right? There's always a lot more to people than meets the eye. So when I intentionally question my assumptions and hold back from them, I find out there's a lot of wise people out there. Often the wisdom is coming from places we don't expect. If we're ready to hear it, we can hear wisdom from people who have seen the ups and downs of life. Remember the insurance commercial, they've seen a thing or two? Well, people that have seen a thing or two have something to offer us. No. They've seen life from both sides, from all sides. Win and lose and up and down, as the song says. Coming to see that people who are different from me may not be as different as I thought. Well, we have, you know, different experiences, backgrounds, gifts, talents, but there's a lot of similarity within us. People who have been to the edges and the bottom of life have something to teach us. You know, when I was young, I was taught to kind of stay away. People have problems, probably need to stay away from them, Rod. If there's something going on, there's something not right, you know, shy back from them. Well, and now I'm realizing that maybe, you know, that might have been good when I was young, but it, uh, I'm, I'm starting to reverse that and, 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 and see the wisdom that's within people that have, you know, had, had troubles in their lives. But if I don't, didn't get past my assumptions, I'd be missing what they have to offer. How open are we to questioning our own assumptions about people and about God? So when we last saw our hapless hero, Jonah, he was still in the belly of the fish or of the whale. He was praying, and then Scripture begins what we have today. The Lord spoke to the fish and spewed Jonah out upon the dry land. Spewed. <laughs> wow. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. 
So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, three days' walk across. Jonah began to go into the city going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's, that's Jonah's words. That's it. Forty days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. The people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and everyone great and small put on sackcloth. So what happens is that they put on sackcloth, that means they're asking for forgiveness, they, they're, they're wanting to right their wrongs, they're, you know, they're humble about it. Um, the king decrees a proclamation, human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, even the animals. <laughs> this is a little bit of a fable, right? But the idea is that everything is in, you know, is asking for forgiveness, is, is, is repenting of their actions and of their godlessness. He says, all shall turn from their evil ways, they shall cry mightily to the Lord. Who knows, maybe God will relent and change his mind, said the king. And then we have, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. So wouldn't you know it, these terrible people from Nineveh, these people that were, you know, that were written off, that Jonah thought had nothing to offer, were going, you know, as far away as they could possibly be, were not in God's good graces in any way, shape, or form, changed. This is the last thing Jonah thought would ever happen. So what about us? Do you think it's possible for people to change? Do you think it's possible for you to change? Do you think it's some, possible for somebody you don't like to change? Or to be more, do you, do, you, do you think, given an opening, that God can bring about change in people, including those who are currently moving away from God? Is that possible? Boston Magazine ran an article by Catherine Osmont, which is entitled, Losing Our Religion. She begins by saying, a seismic shift is underway. The fastest growing religious affiliation in the country is now no affiliation. Many adults are simply leaving religion behind. But as they become parents, they're confronting an uneasy question, what about the kids? She goes on to say that like most upper middle class parents, she and her husband have worked out a strategy for every aspect of their children's lives except religion. Don't know what to do with that. She says her husband was raised Jewish, she was raised Protestant. They kept meaning to address the issue of faith and religion, but somehow it never came up. They never got to that. Who has time, she says. And does it really matter, she says. Catherine Osmott is a member of what the national surveys call the nuns. Maybe you've seen that, N-O-N-E. Nuns, when asked, you know, what is your religious affiliation, they say none. So this is a huge shift in our culture that's becoming the dominant answer. So Catherine Osmond left her religious upbringing in Arkansas and went to Harvard, which her aunt said would ruin her. She says that by my aunt's definition, it did. Without thinking about it, in college she left church, shied away from calling herself a Christian, adopted a more secular understanding of the world, kind of put Jesus in the back. Didn't really have that relationship going anymore. She lived that way for 20 years until she and her husband had children. Then the question came back in the form of questions from her children. Mom, what are those people doing going to church? What do we believe? That's a question. Catherine Osmond didn't have an answer. What do those who would identify themselves as nuns believe? What are our assumptions about them? You know, by their actions and attitudes, are they cutting themselves off from hope? You know, are they going down the trail that we're fearful they 
will take them away from God? Are they still somehow within God's purview, God's realm? More to, the book of, more to the point of the book of Jonah, have we cut people out even if God hasn't? What happened in Nineveh was this. Those Assyrian nuns who didn't believe in God, who were focused on living their lives apart from God, when they heard the word of God, they did the unexpected and they changed. First they wept for their disobedience their repentance, and then they moved to begin living for God. Didn't take much of God's word. Those few words from Jonah, and he only said them half-heartedly, right? He didn't really think anything was going to happen or could happen. God forgave them, showed them grace and mercy. God God changed (laughs) what God had said, what's going to happen clear that uh, Jonah didn't want to have to think about that. He didn't want to change his assumptions. He knew what was going to happen. Something like this actually did happen in Czechoslovakia in 1989, November 27th, 1989, the former communist country, Czechoslovakia. It was decided on that day that everybody in the country would leave their jobs and homes and walk into the streets at noon. Every bell in the country would be rung. On that great day, bells that had been silent for 45 years were rung. Wave upon wave of bonging and every octave echoed across the countryside. Grown men were so excited and moved that they wept openly in the streets. One of the Czech pastors said for the first time they were able to put a sign out in front of their church in Prague. On the sign was written the message, the Lamb has won. I love the way the old preacher Charles Spurgeon describes what happens when people do change, when you know, somehow the word makes its way through, seeps in to them and, and gets a hold of them, uses language that we don't use today, but it's very beautiful language. And this is what he says. As certain fabrics need to be damped before they will take the colorful dye with which they are to be adorned, so our spirits need the dampening of repentance before they can receive the radiant colorings of delight. The glad news of the gospel is best when printed on wet paper. Have you ever seen clearer shining than that which follows a shower? So, The steps we ascend to the palace of delight are usually moist with tears. Grief for sin is the way to where the guests are full of the joy of the Lord. Have you ever felt the the presence of God so strongly that you were moved to tears? Tears were in your eyes, you had to brush them back. Have you ever been moved that way to, to realize that something you were doing probably needs to shift in you? That some, some attitude, some thought, some belief that you've been holding on to, some assumption, some bias has got to change in you and that, that you felt that. You, you, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's a feel, it's an mo- emotional thing. It's not just a thought. It's something that goes on within us. I think something like that happened in Nineveh where people had been closed and doing their own thing when they were open to just a little bit of the word of God, 40 days and the Lord will overthrow you, they changed. It's weeping that leads to joyful assurance of God's love. So God is good and finds multiple ways to get his message through. Ways we don't expect. Moving through barriers, moving through what we, you know, have thought were impenetrable, through our own barriers, through our own judgments. God finds ways through our blind assumptions to meet people with grace and mercy. The word good when referring to God means that God is generous. God is giving. God wants to be involved in our lives. God is looking to be involved in people's lives. God is so good that God shows up with unexpected people in unexpected ways. Sometimes what results is cleansing tears. 
Now, there's a Jewish saying that says that tears are soap for the soul. So let them flow, right? Sometimes what shows up is God's blessing, both on those who did not formerly know it and on those who we assume were not able to receive it. That's the power of God's word. Isaiah, the prophet, said in Isaiah 55, verse 11, he says, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty or void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and purpose. It shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. A more contemporary version says, that's how it is with my word. It doesn't return to me empty without doing everything I send it to do. Now, God's word is more than words. These are words that contain power. They hold power in and of themselves, power to touch, power to convict, power to inspire, power to heal, power to move, power to move us. They're beautiful and wonderful because the Spirit is within them. They cut through the half-truths and the lies and they, they show up what's really there. Carry reality the way life really is because life truly is of God. They show us what is there for all of us underneath when we allow grace to flow. So this subject is personal for me because um, our sons would probably identify themselves as nuns these days. Now, they grew up in church, of course. Um, know a lot about God. One of them knows a lot about, about Scripture and about the church. Phil Zuckerman, a professor at uh, Pitzer College in Claremont, wrote a book called Faith No More, Why People Reject Religion. He says uh, he doesn't like the term nuns. He says, we believe in making the world a better place. We believe in evidence over faith. We believe in reason as a way to address problems. We believe in helping others because that makes the world a better place for everybody. This is what we believe. We do believe. It's not that we don't have anything. Believe in anything. He goes on to say, we're human. We're not nothing. Well, (laughs) it's hard to disagree with wanting all those things to happen. You know, we want the world to be a better place. We, we want to have some, a thoughtful faith. We want to believe that reason is, has a part. You know, we don't have, want to cut our mind, take our minds out of this. We don't want to just turn our, our thoughts off. Uh, we want the world to be better for everybody. It's just that there's more to it than that. It's fine as far as it goes. Misses the point that religion is more than what we figure it out to be. It's not just our own creation. It's not just something that we are, are, are doing because it's a nice thing to do. You know, it's good to be this way. It's more than that. It's more than our own assumptions. It's more than our own biases. Faith, faith is given and received. It's not dreamed up in our minds. You know, we don't make this stuff up given to us. We're receiving it. We're receiving something that has been and is and will be. We don't make our faith up like that. Instead, God grabs hold of us when we allow God to do it. We receive faith and allow God to mold and shape us in conjunction with our hearts and minds. So I got into this with our son and daughter-in-law over the holidays. So we were at a hotel together and I arranged for our younger son to take our little granddaughter to breakfast. This was my plan. That meant I got to be with my other son and his wife, just the three of us. They had me for 20 minutes. And um, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, right? <laughs> We're going to have a difficult conversation right now. So have a seat. We're going to talk about this. Focus was on their daughter, my granddaughter. 
I affirm that they're brilliant and successful. They're my kids. Of course they're brilliant and success successful. He's writing a book, chapters, published. She's getting a PhD and a lot of other things I could tell you about, but not right now. My point was that no book or degree is going to substitute for our granddaughter having a relationship with a personal living God. They don't equate. Now they have a lot of ideas. Fine, good ideas. They're doing good things in the world. He's a professor. She's a, te you know, she's a nurse. A lot of different things. But it's time to bring this piece into their family reality. I know it's hard. I said that many times. I understand that. But she needs more than fairies and nature and ideas, That's what, which is what she gets in the culture, right? She gets a lot of that. But she doesn't get a relationship with God who is bigger than those things, who is real, who isn't just a story, isn't just an imagination, isn't just something that's nice, but a real God that she can turn to, that she knows will be there in her fear. She has her own fears. She knows that she's not a, someone who will assure her that she's not alone. She needs Jesus in her life. And they, and I said, you two have the responsibility to create that environment for her. You've got to do that. That means you have to have all your ideas, fine, all your things that you're working on, all of that's good, but you're going to have to figure out a way to get the real stuff to her. Now, you grew up in church. You know what I'm talking about. You've had that. You know what this is. You are going to have to do it because she's not going to get it on her own. That means you're going to have to find a way to get her to church. I don't care what church. We started talking about which churches. Well, I don't like this church because of this, and I don't like that. And I said, what do you agree on? I don't care which one it is or ones. So we made a list of four churches. When are you going to go to start going to these churches? No. I got them to pledge to me that they were going to do it. Meanwhile, the tears are streaming down my daughter-in-law's face. My son is sitting motionless, you know, not saying anything. I said, you know, I needed to say this this way to you a long time ago. Uh, but now you're hearing it from me. You, know, I, you need to know where I'm coming from. I need to say this for me and for you, but mostly for our little granddaughter who isn't going to get it without you and without me helping to encourage or do whatever I can. So they agreed. We'll see. You know, I don't know. Um, meanwhile, my wife and I have decided to pray for them every day specifically. So that's our part. Because they live a distance away and we're not going to see them. But we can, we can be in touch that way. So some of us find it difficult to believe. Some of us find it difficult to accept faith. Some of us have had experiences where it's, we've gone away. And certainly the church has had a more than checkered history and there's a lot of reasons why people don't want to be involved with church today. I, I, all of that, yes, I understand all of that. But it's for us as parents, as grandparents, as church members to create environment for, for us to get this personal relationship and for us to turn, turn around this image that people have of churches as being self-centered and, and not connected to reality and, and, and not really interested in people and not doing good things. And Glenmar is, you all, we all, are doing this. I'm really happy to say. Just want to encourage this. Encourage this, especially this place for our young people to get this understanding of who they are and who God is as personal. Uh, I even, I said, let's not even talk about what we mean by God because we can get into a lot of discussions on that. Let's just call, instead of God, let's just call, let's call this love with a capital L. 
That's where we're going. We're talking about a relationship, which is love. So, what do we assume about the nuns? What do we assume about our own kids? What I know of this from, is from Scripture and from, from everything that God says is they're not forgotten. They're not lost. They're not cut, you know, dropped by God any more than the Ninevites were, right? You know, they are not, they're not left out. They're simply on a track supported strongly by the culture these days which assumes that church has nothing to offer, that God has nothing really to offer, that this is a lot of ideas, one idea is as good as another one, and we're, we just, we have our own, this is how we think. But it misses the relationship of love that we all need, and that especially our children need. But we all need it too. So, I believe people can change. And from Jonah and the Ninevites, God believes people can change too. People can get this. Somehow the word seeps through. I don't know where or how. You know? So, you know, let's invite those in our lives back to some relationship with God. Maybe we haven't known how to do this. Maybe we haven't known what to say. But it's, it's weighing on our hearts, isn't it? You know, these, this, is, this, is, this, is, this hits close to home for some of us. Invite them back to love. Invite them to experience love. That doesn't mean turn off your minds. No, it doesn't mean to ignore science. No, I'm not talking about that. We're talking about a relationship that's deeper than those things. Come back to God. Invite them to what we know is true, what you know is true, which gets past all the assumptions you know, that we have, that we're lost in. Take those steps. Don't let your assumptions keep them from you, them, keep you from them, or them from God even. In God's mercy and love, let us pray. God, we, we know this is important stuff. We know this relationship that we sometimes rolls off of our tongue is more than just something that rolls off of our tongue. It really is, is what matters most in life. So Lord, help us to, to get a hold in our own lives of what, what it really means to be connected to you, to be following you, to be in your um, light and invite those that we care and love so much to experience that in their own ways and help us to create that environment here for the, the, the young ones that come here, that they may know that when they come into this place, that they are part, they are in a relationship that is deep and wide with a God who is love Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.